Good day, everyone. Neophyte DAG bringing you another message. And in this message, I'm going to have to break the news to you that there was no white race nor white people. There was no black race nor black people. These classifications were invented as social statuses based on how wealthy you were or how poor you were. That's where it originated from, and it had nothing to do with your complexion. In walking you through that very bold statement that I made a while ago, I'm going to give you some background on where the word white race and white people came from. The term white race or white people entered the European language in the late 17th century, to be exact, it's 1676. And it started out as a racialized slavery and unequal social status. That's how it came about due to slavery. And there was status of people that were not equal. So it's a way of making that distinction as to my status is more than your status. In the European colonies, what is that? These are the colonies that were being set up in North America, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean, they were being set up by Spain, Portugal, the Dutch, the French, and in our context that we're going to focus on, the British, the English-speaking colonies. So they set this thing up as a way to distinguish who was of one social status versus another social status. And down in green, I'm going to highlight to you, these society did not have any notion of a white European race. They did not use that. It wasn't part of their thinking at all. So all of this started in the year 1676 related to slavery and how we're going to categorize people, those who were slave for a specific number of years, and those who were slaves for their entire life. Let's find out who became black and who became white. We have to look at the people that were available in the colonies at that time. Let's start with the Indians. They were there, America, whether North, Central or South America, or the Caribbean belonged to the Indians originally. They were living there before the Spaniards arrived before the Portuguese arrived before the English arrived, but we're going to stay on the English for now. And we're going to narrow it down to where all of this took root in Virginia, the first English colony that was successful. So in 1606, that's when the first English colony was set up. There were Indians there. There were dark-skinned Indian, brown-skinned Indian, red-skinned Indians who were already there. Then arrived the European immigrants to Virginia from 1606 to 1676. So the formation of that first English colony to when that change, that term white and black showed up. The immigrants were also dark skin, brown skin, ruddy skin, fair skin, pale skin people. That's the immigrants that were coming. In your history that you're being told, that, that you were told that it was only fair skin and pale skin that were coming as European immigrants. That's a lie. It's an absolute lie. And I'm going to prove that to you. But going with the truth now, in 1676, the poor European immigrants teamed up with the Indians and the exiled Negro slaves and rebelled against the wealthy European immigrants. That's what started the need to break out the social status now. We can't have poor Europeans teaming up with the Indians and the exiled Negro slaves to rebel against the wealthy European immigrants can't afford for that to happen. Among the Indians at that time, they were dark-skinned complexion people, brown-skinned complexion people, red-skinned complexion people, and there were a few 
Blacks that were coming from Europe as indentured servants that were exiled off the West Guinea coast of Africa. But their true origination was from Europe, but they were pushed in with the Indians once they arrived as part of that Guinea coast Africans. The ultimate result, they were teaming up with the poor Europeans to rebel against the wealthy Europeans. We'll read about this in this book. It's called The Class Struggle and the Origin of the Racial Slavery, the Invention of the White Race, written by Theodore William Allens. So this is known. It's nothing new I'm telling you. It's just not taught in school, and it wasn't taught to us. So I want to bring it to your attention. In this book on page 15, this is what Theodore Allen wrote. A policy of forced transportation to perpetual servitude restricted to convicts only that were in England, Ireland, and Scotland, and rebels as well. So what this is telling us, it's one of the hidden history. Again, there were a lot of Europeans that were being forced to come to the Caribbean and North America because they were either categorized as criminal convicts or there were rebels, people that were rebelling against the bourgeois class that was in England, Ireland, and Scotland, and the Wales at that time, and rebelling against religious persecution. They were not able to practice the religion that they wanted to practice. Eventually, they were shipped off from England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales to the Caribbean and North America. In other words, they were spirited out of Europe into the Caribbean and North America. We don't want you in Europe giving trouble, so we're going to spirit you off to the Caribbean and North America. Those were one of the folks that teamed up with the Indians and the exiled Negro slaves to start the rebellion. So that's the part that I want to bring to your attention, that these were one of the agitators of the Bacon Rebellion. That was a rebellion in 1676 that teamed up Indians and the exiled Negro slaves and poor Europeans. The next one I want to bring your attention to is in that same book, page 13, the decisive encounter of people against the bourgeois, bourgeois is the rich, the wealthy European, occurred during the Bacon's Rebellion. It's the elite and the sub-elite versus the poor, and they were arguing over the policy towards the Indians who were the Native American Indians some of them were black-skinned people that were brought in from the Guinea coast as well. But they were mainly the Indian. They were arguing over what to do with the Indians. The Indians then teamed up with the poor Europeans and said, hey, our cause is common. We should team up together and get rid of these elites so we can have more freedom and more access to success in the American new colony. That's in Virginia. Now, what happened? That's where now the white race and the white people category was invented. They learned a lesson from the Bacon Rebellion that if we don't do something to make the poor Europeans think that they're part of the wealthy Europeans, then they're going to team up with the Indians and the exiled Negro slaves again. And we can't afford for that to happen. So what happened as a result of Bacon Rebellion? The class of white race and white people was invented. And those who are to become part of the white race and white people are Europeans, whether you are wealthy or poor. And those who are non-white or are now black race, black people, are Indians or anyone who was from that Guinea coast. Even though they were European before, once you're coming from that Guinea coast where you were exiled to, now you became black race, black people. So let's read from this. The plantation bourgeois, the wealthy, established a system of social control by inventing 
the white race, that institutionalization, I'm breaking it down for you, the inventing of the white race, that's what it means. They invented the white race whereby the poor whites was separated from the blacks, the Indians and the Guinea Coast Europeans that were now classified as blacks. And now they enlisted the poor whites to enforce all the will, all the laws, all the protection of the bourgeois, the elite power, the rich Europeans. So that's how it was invented. We're gonna call you white, even though you're poor, and we're gonna call the others black, and we're gonna give you certain privilege to be in our army, be our police, and help us administer the law, which will protect us and will give you that status. So you have that social you know, dominance over anyone else who does not belong to the white race and the white people social status. In a nutshell, that's where the word white race and white people came from at that time, 1676, and it lasted all the way up until 1924. This is what it looked like after it was invented. The Indians, dark skin, brown skin, and red skin people were categorized as black, as well as the Guinea Coast Africans, but they were Europeans. They were just exiled from Spain and Portugal to the Guinea Coast. One of the examples, if you look at Sao Tome and Principe, Malabo, Cape Verde, and the Canary Islands. Those islands, they're Europeans. They were just exiled out of Europe, Spain and Portugal to be exact, because they were Jewish and the Roman Catholic were persecuting now the Jewish people that were in Spain and Portugal. They kicked them out of Europe and banished them into the Guinea coast. One of the examples is Sao Tome and Principe or the Canary Islands or the Cape Verde Islands. That's where those black European Jews were exiled and they were brought into now North America and the Caribbean because they were sold by the Spaniards and by the Portuguese to the English and the French, first as seven-year indentured servants, then as perpetual servitude slaves. But going back to this, the Indians and those exiled blacks became black. They were categorized as black. Wealthy and poor European immigrants, whether they were dark skin, brown skin, red skin, fair skin, pale skin, were all categorized as white. The poor Europeans, whether they were dark skin, brown skin, red skin, fair skin, pale skin, they were the ones that were making up the army now, the police, and the protector of the wealthy European whites. The colonial army was set up to now as a defense against the rebelling Indians. The police were set up as a defense against the blacks that were on the plantation doing the works, and they were protecting the interests of the wealthy Europeans. That's the end result of the invention of the white race. This lasted from 1676 to 1924. It did not change drastically. Few modification, but the principle remained the same. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to give you examples of the army that was set up and the people that made up this army that were from Europe. I'm going to show you from Europe, they were not only pale complexion or fair skin people, they were of dark skin complexion, ruddy skin, which is red skin complexion, and all different types of complexion coming out of Europe to North America and the Caribbean. What we're going to look at, a prime example, and it's in many other army muster roll. A muster roll is a list of soldiers that's enlisted in each company. And I'm going to take a look at George Washington's muster roll for his army that he was in control of, in command of, in 1756. And what you're going to notice, dark, brown, red, ruddy complexion, skin person, 
of European ancestry made up majority of the enlisted soldiers. Look at the complexion description. This is coming from the Virginia Colonial Soldier. It's a book put together by Lloyd DeWitt Boxtrot. On page 103 of this book, that's where George Washington's muster roll is given. Many other muster rolls are given, but I chose George Washington's because he was one of what we call now the founding father of the United States of America that formed in 1776 after the colonial rule had ended. Let's continue with George Washington's muster roll. And what I've done here, I've done some highlights just to give you tips on how to read the muster roll. Let's look at Reuben Vass. He enrolled in September 1755. He's from the Essex County. He's 25, 5'10". He's a joiner. His birthplace is Virginia and he's dark complexion. So in 1755, a dark complexion person from Virginia was in the army. So that's how you would read this muster roll. And it does that for every enlisted soldier. Let's look at another one. Let's look at Charles Stringham. He's from Augusta and from New York. And he's of ruddy complexion. Another dark skin complexion person, another black person, what we categorize now as black skin. And it continues. I'm, and, and I'm only staying now with the dark skin complexion people because we have enough history of fair skin and pale skin complexion person being the only ones arriving in America and the Caribbean. And I want to show you that's not true. Let's go down to John Trigg. He's from Virginia. He's of brown complexion. But it doesn't stop there. That's just a warm up. I'm showing you that in George Washington's army, they were dark skinned, what we categorize now as black people in his army. And if you look at the others, you'll see fair, you'll see some other dark skin, and you'll see fair, ruddy complexion. When you see fair, ruddy, fair has two meanings in terms of what it's trying to describe. If you see fair by itself, that means it's clean, it's no blemish on it. And then you'll see the actual color of the complexion thereafter. So looking at, say, for example, James Campbell, he's from Scotland. He's fair. That means his complexion, he doesn't have any chops, any cut, any smallpox, but he's of a ruddy complexion. So his complexion, he's of a red skin. He has no blemish on his skin. That's what fair, comma, ruddy complexion means. The ruddy complexion has always been a mystery to people. What does it look like? What are they talking about when I see the word ruddy? So what I'm presenting to you here are examples of what a ruddy complexion is. So when you read about it in various books, you'll get a framework in your mind as to what they're talking about. So a ruddy red, it's the image on the left-hand side where it's a reddish skin tone matched with a reddish color here. That's a ruddy red complexion. And the picture on the right, that's a ruddy gold. It's a lighter skin complexion with the same redness to the hair. So it's ruddy red and ruddy gold. So when you see and hear things talking about ruddy complexion, this is what they're talking about. So get that picture in your mind. So when these words pop up on you again, you can quickly identify what they're talking about, especially when it relates to people of color, historical documents, because this is the way they were describing the people that look like this in those times before they changed their categorization to black. Let's continue with George Washington's muster roll. We've covered just on this page about four dark skin complexion person. We'll go to other pages of George Washington muster roll because it doesn't stop there. He had a whole slew of enlisted soldier. But now what I want to get you to, which is the critical point, let's start with Thomas Brown. He's from Ireland, dark complexion. You might say, why? Wow, you know, how can he be from Ireland? 
and dark complexion. What we know now, Ireland, they're, they're pale skin, fair skin complexion. There's no dark skin complexion in Ireland. Wasn't the case. They were. If you go down to Arthur Dent, he's from England, brown skin complexion. And I'm reading from the left side of the page and I'm starting from top going down, just giving you examples of Europeans that were of dark skin complexion in Virginia, in America. The same is true for any of the English speaking Caribbean countries. These people, these same types of people were there. Okay, so let's continue. Let's go down to Lawlin McLean. He's a planter, he's from Scotland, brown complexion. So I'm touching on places that we think there are no dark skin or brown skin complexion people coming from there, but that's absolutely false. This is giving you the location of countries and their complexion. John Nugent, he's a butcher and he has a brown complexion. William Begant, dark complexion from England. Edward Whitehead from Ireland, brown complexion. Continue, I won't read all of them, but I'm giving you a framework that yes, there are darks in people in those countries. If you scan this, you'll go back to my conclusion here that majority of the enlisted soldier in George Washington's company were dark, brown, and ruddy complexion soldiers telling you most of the people that were in North America at that time were black people, what we would categorize as black Europeans. They weren't majority Caucasians as we think now. The founding colonial people were dark brown and ruddy complexion people. Going back to this list here, keep going through it, you'll keep seeing dark skin, brown skin, ruddy complexion, and they're all from various parts of Europe. Let's go down to John Fisher. He's closer down to the, the bottom of the left-hand side. John Fisher, he's from Germany, dark complexion. Goes back to what I'm telling you. You'll see if you scan through, just for example, Peter Magnus, the bottom of the left-hand portion, he's from Scotland, Pale complexion. So they're telling you, hey, they're pale complexion people here also. But if you go through this list, majority, I would say probably 80 to 90% of the enlisted soldier are dark skin, brown skin, and ruddy complexion skin persons, which confirm again, most of the colonial people that were coming here from the beginning in 1603 until this muster roll was put together in the 1757 were dark skin complexion people, brown skin complexion people, ruddy complexion skin people, but that we're now categorizing as black people in our modern day time. Let's go to the right hand side to show it's not only England, Ireland, and Scotland. We covered Germany already. About halfway down on the right-hand side, we'll look at Solomon Long. And Solomon Long, it's telling you, he's from Holland, red complexion, which is ruddy complexion. Goes back to what I'm telling you. Further down on the right-hand side, if you look at George Lewis, he's from the Wales. He's brown complexion. The list continues. You can go through the list and see for yourself what I'm telling you, and you'll come to the same conclusion. Most of the people that were enlisted in the colonial army, the poor Europeans were of dark skin complexion, ruddy skin complexion, brown skin complexion, Let's read the muster roll of Captain Thomas Wagner. It's on the right-hand side of the screen. You'll come to the same conclusion again. Dark, and they're from Europe. Let's take a read. Francis Austin is from, or currently residing in Prince William's, 
county of Virginia. He's from England and he's dark. Want to continue? Let's look at Samuel Poe. He's currently residing in North Cumberland. He's dark skin complexion. He's from England. Want to continue? John Croak. He's from the Stafford County of Virginia. He's of brown complexion and his birthplace was Ireland. And it continues, keep going on. We go down to George Solomon. He's now residing in Stratford at that time. He's of ruddy complexion, red complexion. He's from Scotland. And it keeps going on. One that I want to bring to your attention, George Jenkins. He's of a swarthy complexion, dark skin complexion. And he's a drummer from Virginia. Keeps going. Thomas Williams, he's of a brown skin complexion. He's from the Wales. And if you keep going through, you'll see all of these dark skin complexion people that are from Europe that was in the colonial army. I don't need to provide any more proof because, again, the proof is only going to tell you the same thing I'm showing you here. It's in the Virginia Colonial Army book. Look it up. There are plenty other muster roll that's giving you the same information. I'm just pointing these to you just to show you that within the colonial army of Virginia, majority of them were dark skin, brown skin, ruddy skin, complexion people. Let's look at the New York provincial muster roll. Yes, New York had its own colonial army, and we'll take a look at it, and we'll come to the same conclusion. Dark, brown, and red-skinned people from Europe made up the majority of the enlisted soldier. This one is more simplified for you. This is what the role looked like on the left side of the screen that gave you the name, description of the person. On the right side, it gives you where they were born, and their complexion. John Cosman, he was born in Germany, is of a brown complexion. Same thing for the next two people below him, Harmon Lower, Adam Kronk, they're from Germany and they're brown. List goes on. And if you take a look to see where born, you'll see England, you'll see Germany, you'll see Ireland, they're all brown all brown. So it's telling you all these brown skin complexion people, they're born in Europe. They're not from Africa or the Guinea coast. They're from Europe, brown skin, ruddy skin, dark skin. They're coming from Europe. That's why I'm spending this much time because I have to break that psychosis that have been played on us, that it was only white but they're not telling you the white was a social status which encompass dark skin, brown skin, red skin, pale skin, fair skin, light skin. People from Europe that were by default classified as white. They're lumping in five to six different complexion people into one category and giving you that one category as it's all Caucasian. No, it's not. From here, this is a 1758 muster roll, and you can see a wide variety of complexion, and they're coming from Europe. Some were already living here, if you see them from Suffolk County, from Long Island, from Jersey. They're already here. They're from Rye as well. They were already here from 1603 up until 1758. Their family was already established here, and there were more of them coming in to North America. This is the New York muster roll for 1760. Same trend. They're from England, Ireland, from Prussia, from Germany, from New Zealand, from Dublin, from the Nevis, Nevids meaning that, that's the Caribbean. They were even bringing soldiers in from the Caribbean from the Nevis. They were all brown skin. Some were Negro now, the Nevis one, because he now came from that Guinea coast 
exile that was brought in as a slave into the Caribbean, he got the Negro classification because anyone who was either a native Indian or a black person brought from one of the exiled Guinea Coast Islands off the west coast of Africa that the Spanish and the Portuguese controlled, they had a Negro categorization given to them. But if you look, they're brown, ruddy, and coming from Europe, I'm not making this thing up, the information is there. The New York Provincial Muster Roll, it's put together by the New York Historical Society. They have this information. All we have to do is just get to know where it is, and I'm presenting it to you. So if you want to do your own research, you can go do it. The New York Provincial Troop Roll, it continues. Same information being given to you, but I'm just leaving it up on the screen where you can get enough time to see what I'm trying to tell you. Where they're born? The ruddy and brown-skinned people, Germany, London, they're all over the place. They're from Ireland. They're from all over the place. Scotland, they're from Bristol, all over the place. But they're coming into America and they're joining America's army because they're from Europe. From Europe, many different complexion people were there, but majority of them that were living in Europe at the time were dark skin, brown skin, ruddy skin people. Over time, they got phased out. We'll cover that in future messages, but I wanna keep you now with the core of this invention of the white race. All these people that I'm telling you, ruddy and brown and so on, they were white at that time. That's the social class they were put in. That changed later on, but we'll stay with the muster roll this is the muster roll again, same thing, continuing the ruddy, the brown, even the Indians now are brown. William Oliver, he's an Indian and he was brown. Just to show you that brown doesn't mean some other brown, it's still the same brown as what they were being categorized as for the European, the same complexion. We even have a person from Spain, Francisco Caslia, he was dark mulatto. He was born as a mixed race, a mixture between someone who was from, who was in Spain, that is of a dark skin, brown skin, that mixed with a native person of the Indian tribes, and he became a mulatto. You look further down, a black Indian popping up. And so you look at it, we're born, you'll see London, Germany, Holland, which is Netherlands, Ireland, they're all over the place, all over Europe, coming into America, joining the army, dark skin people. You look on the right-hand side, you go down the list and just see where fair is. Only a few fair, probably about five or six fair, the rest is dark, ruddy. Brown. Rob Coates, he's dark. These are the people that were in New York at the time joining the New York Army. Where are they coming from? They're coming from Europe. This is the Army in 1761. Same trend, just new terms now being given to you. And the reason why I'm walking you through this year by year, you'll see new terminology popping up on the complexion portion of it but it's, again, still coming from different countries that we thought there were no dark-skinned people that were living in at that time. Robert Roberts, he's a gentleman from Antigua. Again, he's a brown gentleman. The only reason why he's a gentleman, and we'll cover that later on, is because he's part of the Stuart family, meaning he's part of the King James line of descendants that were exiled to Antigua. They were giving too much problems in England around 1746 as part of the Jacobites' rebellion, and they kicked them out of England and shipped them over to Antigua. But he remained a gentleman, meaning a someone distinguished and renowned 
in Antigua and he came over to New York. After his indentured service ended in Antigua, he came over to New York and he enlisted in the New York Army but he's a brown skin complexion. Just to give you some flavor, when you see gentlemen, that mean they're always from a line of family that were dukes, duchess, royals, and so on and so forth. I want to bring you to John Wood. He's from England. He's swarthy. He's swarthy. That means he's a black person. Swarthy means dark skin. So that's why I brought this one in, because you see swarth and swarthy coming in. But the fact doesn't change. Majority of these people that are coming from all these European countries were dark, brown, swart, and swarthy. Very few are fair skin. Very few are pale skin. Majority of the people that were starting up America, inventing America, running America, were what we call in our nowadays black people. Most of them came from Europe. Some came from other parts of the Caribbean. Some came from the Guinea coast of Africa. Some came as Native American. If you look, you'll see Christopher Amenon. I might be messing up his name. He's from Prussia. He's fair-skinned. So they're telling you where they're from and what complexion, but majority of the Europeans coming in they're from a dark skin, brown skin, swarthy skin, and ruddy skin complexion. Which brings me now to what happened when the United States became united and started a formal process of how immigrants would come into this country and be documented. They developed an immigration form, 2203, it's called the Declaration of Intention. And on that form, you have to put in what class you belong to and what skin complexion you had. And you'll see where dark-skinned people are classified as white. That's the reason why I want to show you these forms. That dark skin, even though we're saying they're dark skin, they are white in terms of how the United States defined them during colonial time and after colonial time, 1776, all the way to 1924. This is a form. This is what it looks like, the Declaration of Intent. And where am I going to point you to? It's on the description. It says color. And if you look on both of these forms, you see the color white. Absolutely white. But if you look at the complexion, the complexion is ruddy. And we know ruddy is a red complexion. It's still a dark-skinned person, but of a red complexion. I also want to bring you to country of birth. I was born in, if you look on the one of the left, England. If you look on the one on the right, he was born in England as well, Liverpool, England. But they were ruddy complexion, but they were white status. Let's move on. John Thomas McCormack. Color white, complexion dark. Same thing with David Stuart McDonald. Once you see Stuart, he's from the King James line of family. That's where the Stuart name, the Stuart clan from Scotland originated from. That name, anywhere you see Stuart. Just a spoiler alert. Anyone of dark skin complexion that is called a Stuart has their origin in Scotland, the Stuart clan, which the King James Stuart family line comes from. Going back to this. David Stewart McDonald is white color, dark complexion. And if you look where David Stewart McDonald is from, he's from Scotland. Just to reaffirm what I'm telling you about the Stewart clan and what I'm telling you hidden behind my message is that the Stewart clan in Scotland were all black. Scotland was majority black. That's what I'm telling you. 
you'll see that later on as the message and more messages are put out. Going back to John Thomas McCormack, where is he from? He's from Ireland. Dark-skinned person coming from Ireland. That might whip your head back a little bit because it's not what you're expecting. But these documents are telling the truth. I'm not lying. These documents are there to prove it. And if you look, you'll see the big stamp and the big seal on it. The seal is there. That means it's a seal of approval from the government itself. That stamp of approval that these documents exist. More of those documents. This person, white color, dark complexion. Where is he from? He was born in Germany. This is Herman Robert. He's from Germany. The other one on the right side, Ed Vaines. White, yeah, but he's dark complexion. He's from Netherlands. Showing you all over Europe. These dark skinned people, these black people are there but they were being categorized as white, even though their complexion was dark or ruddy or brown. Let's continue. Frank Samuels, I might be messing that name up, but white again, but he's dark. Where is he from? He's from Austria. Austria have black people. Yes, they were there. The seal of approval is there. The United States government, on their documentation, they have to put the truth. They'll put the lies out in other mainstream medium if you don't search to go find the other truth that's buried somewhere else. Oscar Berman, he's white color. That's a category, social category that he's in, but his complexion is dark. Where was he born? He was born in Belgium. Yes, black people were in Belgium as well. That's what I'm showing to you. On both documents, you can see the stamp embossed on the pages. These are real documents. Let's move on. Jake Solomon, white social status, but he's dark skin complexion. Where is he from? Hungary. Yes, there were black people in Hungary stamp of approval on his form. Let's jump to the other side. August Young. He's white in social status, dark skin complexion. Where is he from? He was born in Sweden. Yes, there were blacks in Sweden as well. And if you look at the time of these documents, they're all late 1800 to early 1900. So all the way up until 1924, this is how these documents were being filled out. If you're from Europe, you're automatically white, regardless of your complexion, because white was a social status, not a skin color, as you've been led to believe. Later on, it became that but I'm taking you back in time when it wasn't. More forms. I, I'm going to hammer these forms home to you because I want you to get the message. But this one now, I'm throwing in some curveballs on you. Herman Morales. He's white. Dark skin complexion. Where was Herman born? In Puerto Rico. That's where he's from. If you're Puerto Rican at that time, you were white. Even though your complexion was dark, you were white because you belong to a Spanish possession. Spain, meaning you belong, you're from Spain, you're still attached to Europe. You were white, even if you were dark skinned. Let's look at the one on the right side. Joseph Assad is white of dark skin complexion. Where was he born and where is he from? He was born in Beirut, Syria. It's a dark skin person from Syria. So even though he was dark skin, white was his classification. This is all the way up until 1923. He came in 1905, but he filled out this form in 1923. 
This is the information that I want to bring to you that even though you were dark skin complexion, but you were given a white classification, if you're from Europe or possession of Europe, and you were not part of the Native American Indians or Native American Blacks, or you were not taken from that Guinea coast where you were exiled from and brought into America as a perpetual servitude slave. If you weren't any of those two, you were white, no matter what your skin color was. But I won't stop there. I'm going to give you the example of fair, light, and medium skinned people classified as white. I don't want you to walk away saying, well, it could have been talking about those fair skinned people or light skinned people or whatever. I want to give you full disclosure on the form itself. And here's the form drafted up now for fair skinned people Alex Smith, white color, fair skin complexion. He's from Hungary. So we looked at another Hungarian who was dark and who was black. And now we're looking at one who was fair skin, what we would categorize now as the white race. But in that time, they were all white, separated by complexion, and then where you're from in terms of your social status. Let's look on the right. August Edward, I won't attempt his last name at this point, but his color is white, his complexion is fair. He's from Sweden. So we looked at a dark skin Sweden, and now we're looking at a fair skin. There it is again. All different types of people categorized as social status white because they're from Europe or they're from another country and did not fit those two descriptions I gave you. You're a Native American Indian, or a dark-skinned, brown-skinned person that was brought in from the Guinea coast where exiled Europeans were placed. Let's look at two more, then I'll bring this one to an end in terms of my example of declaration of intent. Francis Cavina, white of a medium complexion, that's where you'll put in still what we would classify as a fear but less fairness, less paleness. That's a person from Austria. We have already covered a dark-skinned Austrian. Now they're breaking it out to medium. And then on the right side, John Jowanowski, white, his complexion is light. He's from Russia, giving you examples of various complexion all classified as white social status. It was a social status at that time, undisputed. Now, what happened? What really happened to get us where we are right now in terms of we see white as a Caucasian person and that's it. There's nothing else we see it as. And we see black as anyone who has a dark skin, a brown skin, or any shade that's not Caucasian. That's what happened in 1924, where a law was passed. It's called the Racial Integrity Act of 1924, which is what's governing our law and our mindset to this present day. What happened with that act, that Racial Integrity Act? If you had any trace of blood within you, any trace, whatever small amount, that is not a Caucasian bloodline, you were automatically kicked out of the white classification and you were moved into a black classification. You had to have a pure Caucasian blood and bloodline to be classified as white. That's what this law proclaimed as law. So by default, the fair skin the light and the pale skinned people that we covered in all those form 2203, the declaration of intention and all the muster rolls, only those now were classified as white because you had to have 
a Caucasian bloodline and the Caucasian bloodline, they're all fair skin, light skin, and pale skin complexion people. So only those people were classified as white status. What happened to all the other people? In item two, people with no trace of Caucasian blood were classified as colored. That's what occurred in 1924. So all dark skin, brown skin, ruddy skin persons, you automatically became a colored person in 1924. Then an amendment law was enacted in 1930 where the dark skin, brown skin, ruddy complexion skin people who were classified as colored in 1924, now their status automatically changed to black in 1930. There was an automatic switch in their status from colored to black in the 1930 amendment to the Racial Integrity Act. As a result of the Racial Integrity Act, if you could not trace your bloodline to a pure 100% Caucasian bloodline, if trace of any other race bloodline was found in your blood, then you cannot get the white status and you were automatically classified as a colored and then a black status. So all the mixed children, if your mother was fair skin, pale skin, light skin complexion, and your father was a dark skin, brown skin, ruddy skin complexion person, poof, you're colored or black. And if your father was fair skin, light skin, pale skin complexion, and your mother was a dark skin, brown skin, ruddy skin complexion person, you automatically were a black or colored person. It had to be pure Caucasian, fair skin, light skin, pale skin, in order to be given that white classification. So a lot of people, when that occurred, try to figure out ways to fit yourself into either white or black classification. This is the additional information that I'm gonna give you on the Racial Integrity Act of 1924. Classifying as white a person who has no trace whatsoever of any blood other than a pale skin, fair skin, complexion person bloodline. If you had any trace, even though majority of you were of the Caucasian blood, but you have traces of other blood, you were not a white classification person. Absolutely not. And what happened? As part of the Racial Integrity Act, all of this had to be written in on the birth certificate and marriage certificate. Started out in Virginia, other states adopted it as either white or colored, and then later on in 1930, it changed from white or black. That classification had to be put on your birth certificate and your marriage certificate. That's what happened. So that's what we inherit now where we're looking because all the previous history on white being of dark skin, brown skin, red skin, pale skin, fair skin, that was totally pushed off to the side. We lost all sight of that. And all we have to base our knowledge on is the remnants of the Racial Integrity Act. White or colored, white or black. Then further down to affirm what I was telling you, in 1930, an additional act defined any person with a trace of African ancestry. That's where, again, we got affected. We were shoved into the colored category. But now, because... We're saying you're from the Guinea coast, you're from Africa. And then if we say you're from the Guinea coast, then you have African-American ancestry and then you're black. In a nutshell, the Racial Integrity Act move all the dark skin, brown skin, ruddy skin people out of the white classification, the white social class, and threw them into the black social class and they now mixed in 
All the Europeans are now mixed in with the Native Americans and the Guinea black people that were exiled and brought into America. They're all mixed in as one big bunch now, and you can't tell who is who. Three class of people were thrown into the black colored category. The dark skin, brown skin, ruddy skin Europeans. The dark skin, brown skin, ruddy skin Europeans that were exiled from Spain and Portugal into the Guinea Coast Islands, such as Sao Tome and Principe, Malabo, Cape Verde, and the Canary Islands were now thrown into that black and colored category. And then the Native American Indians, whether the traditional looking Native American Indians, the ones that were constantly given as the only Indians that were in America, or the dark skin Africanoid features, Native American Indians that were in America as well. They were all thrown into the black category. One bunch, you can't separate one from the other until now in this time when we're going to get an opportunity to know all those who are bunched into that black category. And through more work, we're going to be able to pull all the three categories apart and know who is who. Conclusion. What can we conclude from this? One thing for certain, black and white classification of people did not exist before 1676, whether in Europe or in the Americas, did not exist at all. Secondly, the black and white classifications were set up as social and class statuses starting in the year 1676 as a result of the Bacon Rebellion, and it's to prevent poor Europeans from joining up with poor Native Americans and poor Europeans that were exiled to the Guinea Islands off the coast of West Africa and then sold into slavery in America. They did not want those people to join forces and overthrow the wealthy Europeans that were also dark skin, brown skin, ruddy skin, fair skin, pale skin. Thirdly, the black and white classifications were changed to blood tracing of whether you're African descent or Caucasian descent. That occurred after 1924. And then in 1930, more laws were added. But item three remained the same until now in our present time. This is what this information that I'm bringing to you, I wanted to expose to you. So now when you're looking at yourself and you look at yourself as the category of a black person, you'll know that there are three possibilities of your existence. Not just one, you're from Africa and that's it, not a chance. Three possible outcome of your existence and later messages I'm gonna help you figure out what category you belong to. First category, you could be from North America, one of the native Indians that were dark skin with Africanoid features. You could belong to that classification. Also with that classification, those native Indians and native blacks were shipped off to the Guinea coast and then recycled back into North America, the Caribbean and South America. And I'll get into that in later message. I don't wanna throw too much at you in one message. You could be from the Guinea coast of West Africa where your ancestors were exiled out of Spain and Portugal and sent there and then sold into slavery into the Caribbean, North America, South America, and Central America. And you could be from Europe, all over Europe. Black people were there, what we classify now in our modern day as black. They were there, dark skin, brown skin, ruddy skin. But this is the conclusion I want you to get from this. You're black only as a social status. A lot of you, most of you, 
were of the social status of white all the way up until 1924. And then you were kicked out of that category and bunched into the black category. I'm going to bring this message to a close and as always, have a blessed and wonderful day.